Hello everyone. This presentation will cover various nursing research paradigms and methods which will include qualitative, quantitative, and mixed. So first of all, what in the world is a paradigm? A paradigm happens to be the way we view the world. Each of us sees the world in a little bit different way, and so the way we view the world is the way that we typically approach research, whether nurses or any other discipline. And you'll see on the screen that there's really two big paradigms that we use in nursing research, although there are other ones. We'll mostly focus on the two here on the slide, which include positivist and the constructivist. Sometimes you'll see the constructivist paradigm called something else, like the naturalistic paradigm. Um, but we're gonna try to stick with constructivist to be consistent throughout this presentation. So just remember, when I say the word paradigm, all I mean is the way we view the world and specifically the way we view research. So let's look a little bit more closely at each of these two big paradigms. The positivist paradigm typically is the scientific method. If you went through school and participated in a science fair, then you're likely familiar with a scientific method, which includes making a hypothesis conducting an experiment and trying to test to see if your hypothesis was probably correct or not. So as you see, a, a researcher who approaches the world in a positivist framework typically believes that there is one answer out there. If I can create a study and do this research in a specific manner, then I can find that one answer. Typically, I have to control things very tightly in an experiment so that I can find that one answer that exists for everyone out there. Um, because I have to keep everything in control as a positivist researcher, I have to, main, to make sure my research is not biased in any way and that I am disconnected from the research in general. On the other hand, a constructivist researcher believes that everyone makes or constructs their own reality. If I ask you what it's like to be a nursing student, and then I ask someone else what it's like to be a nursing student, I'm going to hear two very different answers. There may be some similarity, similarities or overlap, but we all experience life from a little bit of a different perspective. And so constructivist researchers believe that I can't just throw a survey at someone and understand the full experience of their lives. Therefore, I have to interact with them in a very intimate manner to interview them and ask them what the meaning of their life experiences have been. Therefore, there is a little bit of subjectivity in constructivist research, and that's actually valued by constructivist researchers. So as you can see, these are two very, very different types of research. And just to drive home that paradigm again, remember, we're looking at the world of nursing research, but the way a constructivist researcher views the world is different from the way a positivist. So as you see on this picture, if you look at it from just a bird's eye view, it looks like a frog sitting on something in, in a pond. However, if you flip it over and look at it from a different perspective, it looks like a horse. So we're studying the same types of things and we're really trying to help create answers for nursing problems but we approach them from two different perspectives. So within both of these frameworks or paradigms that I just mentioned, we have two big broad classes of research. You see quantitative and you see qualitative research. So the positivist scientific method, which is very controlled, is going to be considered quantitative research. Okay. And you see on this, the slide that I put that it uses empirical evidence. What empirical evidence is, is something that I can actually measure. I can see it. I can calculate it. Um, think of the things that we typically measure as nurses. Blood pressure, um, heart rate, um, look for pitting edema. Those are things that I can look, listen, and feel and measure. So that is what empirical evidence is. And typically we turn that into a number so that we can run statistical analysis on it to answer our research questions. And so therefore, when you think of the word positivist and controlled one answer, think of quantitative research. 
when you think of quantitative, think of numbers, quantity. Now, on the other hand, qualitative research is mostly associated with the constructivist or the naturalist paradigm. And they believe that I have to talk to people and hear their stories or watch them in their natural environments so that I can truly understand what their life is like because no two people are going to experience life the same way, okay? So this is just a little chart that kind of breaks those two apart, quantitative versus qualitative. And I've alluded to many of the things here, but I just want to refresh your memory. I did bold a couple of these because they are the most important, if you will. Quantitative is very prescriptive. We have a plan, we follow the plan, we don't deviate from the plan. So I must do my study as I've pre-planned, step one, two, three, four. However, qualitative research can be very flexible and is usually very flexible. We start with a plan in mind. However, if something's not working, we can always go back to the drawing board and kind of do something different. And that's okay with a qualitative um, constructivist type research study. Um, also, I think it's important to notice that qualitative is holistic. You see this word right here. When we're doing quantitative research, we're typically trying to drill down to one little piece of the human experience. So I might just be going and drawing blood to check your serum cortisol level because I think that that is a good measure of how stressed you are. However, stress is not just cortisol levels, okay? The way we experience stress is very different. So instead of just looking at a number on a lab printout, a qualitative researcher believes that, yeah, that might be good, but what if I talk to the person and ask them to tell me what a typical day in your life is like? How does that make you feel? And what does that mean to you? So it is very different there. Um, also, you'll see that the differences in measurement are, are pretty, pretty uh, substantial. With quantitative research, we have to use a formal measurement instrument. We collect the data through these instruments. So it might be a 10 item questionnaire. It might be a blood glucose level. However, qualitative, the people we're interviewing are our instrument. We don't have a piece of paper with questions on them that they're going to just circle and answer. We talk to them. We hear their stories. Um, for deductive versus inductive, it goes back to the paradigm. With quantitative, we deductively look at things because we believe that we can drill down to one single answer that holds true for the mostly the entire population of people like we're studying. However, qualitative believes that we need to increase our focus. We start with maybe 10 women who we've talked about to see what their experience with breast cancer has been, but then we take what we heard from those eight interviews and we increase it to say, well, everybody could possibly be like this. So it's very different as you see here. One other type of research that has become more common in the last couple, last decade or so is mixed method research. And it's exactly like it sounds. We're mixing both paradigms or both methods of research together. So we, in one study, have both quantitative and qualitative designs in there. Okay. So some of the questions we want to know the answers to require mixed methods. And I'll show you an example of that in a later slide. Um, however, there are definite advantages to mixed methods research. First of all, complementar complementarity means that both methods can complement each other. So we're asking things via a survey, but we're also asking them via interview. And we can get the subtle nuances of the full picture by looking at both of them complemented together. And then also, if the participants are saying the same thing on paper and by mouth, that increases the validity of our study results, which is something we definitely are striving for as a researcher. This is a couple of the ways that researchers do mix method studies. Um, there's concurrent versus sequential. With concurrent, that means we're collecting quantitative and qualitative data at the same time. With sequential, we collect one 
and then we collect the other. It's a separate process. This is an example of a mixed method study. I put the citation at the bottom. You'll see at the bottom of this paragraph that it says the objectives of the study were twofold. First of all, the researchers wanted to identify the predictors of stress between generic and accelerated BSN students. So to do that, they likely did a survey. Here's a survey, what mostly stresses you out? But the second part is not gonna be able to be done by survey. We wanted the participants to describe what stressed them and what coping strategies worked for them the best. You're not gonna get that rich of an information through a survey. So instead, they used probably interviews. All of these paradigms have differences, but they also have some similarities. And the main point I wanna drive home here is that we're relying on human cooperation. I, the researcher, am human, so therefore I'm prone to making mistakes in my planning and conducting of the study, but also the people are my participants. Therefore, they may not always be honest with me or may kind of fudge their answers on surveys or interviews. Also, we have to maintain ethical considerations, and we'll get into that a little bit later in this course, but those are some very key hallmarks that span all of these paradigms we've talked about. The main point is at the bottom, and you will hear me say this over and over in this course for a good reason. I think sometimes we get into research articles and we read it and we think, wow, this is great. However, please remember that there is no such thing as a perfect research study. So we have to be, we have to read studies with a keen eye of what possibly could have been done better and what possibly could taint the results of the research study that we're looking at. And so my last two slides are going to be snapshots of studies that you may that may look like those you read. So this one's title is Effects of Informal Caregivers on, functions of, of, on the Function of Older Adults in Home Health Care. And this is just the abstract. A lot of times if you read the title and you look at the abstract, you can tell pretty quickly if it's quantitative or if it's qualitative. And in doing so in this one, you can definitely see that this is quantitative. First of all, a good clue, Anytime you see the word effects in a title, more than likely it's quantitative because we're trying to show something caused something else, caused an effect. So effect is typically, typically going to be quantitative, but also what are all, look at all these statistical symbols in the abstract. It's also a good idea that this is quantitative. Now it could be mixed, but for our purposes right now, this is a quali mm -mm, quantitative study. And the last one, the title, The Meaning and Use of Spirituality, so we don't, the meaning of, you're not going to get that with a survey. You're going to have to interview people and find their stories. So this is definitely qualitative. And we can look at the abstract and see that there are no statistics. Okay, we don't see all those symbols. And it paints a picture of these women's worldview. So this is qualitative. All right, so hopefully after watching this video, you have a better idea of broad uses for quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods, as well as the distinction between positivist and constructivist paradigms. And we'll continue to build upon this content as we advance throughout the course this semester. Thanks for watching.